Hey, Hammy here, coming at you today with this video on 9.2, on which we will look at some of the evidence we have for evolution occurring. One of the first things almost any scientist will bring up when we talk about evolution and uh, proof or evidence of evolution, we're gonna, they're gonna talk about fossils. Okay? And this comes from the work of paleontologists. Okay, those are the scientists who study and find and study fossils. Uh, the fossil record, if uh, we have a lot of records of creatures uh, that when we, this would be very, very old down here, and this would be the most recent over here. Uh, and for example, this is the fossil history of the horse that a lot of textbooks put forth, uh, where, you know, here's a very short horse. So you go from very short creature to a very tall creature um, as they moved out out of the jungles, out onto the plains. They got longer legs to run from predators. Uh, and so you can see their four feet. They used to have four or five toes. Uh, that slowly is narrowed down just to one toe, okay, or a hoof. Uh, you can look at their molars, how their molar teeth have changed throughout evolutionary history. Their height uh, has changed. And so we have these records of sort of kind of different forms of a creature that came after one another. Uh, there are some missing links and pieces in different things. Uh, some scientists will argue we, they were either not fossilized or we just haven't found those missing links or those missing pieces yet in the fossil record. And uh, as we continue to find more fossils, we'll continue to fill in more gaps uh, in the evolution of, of different creatures. Another thing scientists use uh, for evidence for evolution is comparative anatomy. Now, there's several things that fall under this category. Uh, the first one is homologous structures. Okay, remember, homo means the same. So structures that are similar or have the same structure uh, in related organisms because they come from a common ancestor. So if you look at a human arm, okay, you have your humerus bone, and then you have the ulna, and the radius on your thumb side, and then you have a bunch of carpals, and then your phalanges, okay, or your digits that make up your fingers. If you look at the arm or limb structure of other things, so here's the human right here. So you have one bone, two bones, a whole bunch of bones, about six, and then all the digits down here. Okay, if you look at a lizard, same thing, one bone, two bones, wrist, and then five fingers. Cat, same thing whales which have a flipper one bone two bones okay wrist and then digits okay the bat one bone these two bones are kind of fused in five digits frog bird wing okay now notice they don't all have the same function okay here's a wing for flying a uh, frog which has webbed feet here's a whale flipper for swimming a cat lizard human for walking uh, it's be the similar in our legs as well. We have the similar bone structure. Okay, so they might have a different function. Okay, but if you look at the bone structure underneath, they have a same or similar structure. Okay, so that's homologous structure, similar structure, even though that body part might be used for different functions. The other one we use for comparative anatomy, kind of the opposite is analogous structures. Okay, and analogous structures, uh, these are structures that are similar in unrelated organisms. So, so oftentimes very different structurally, okay, different structure. Uh, if you look at the bee wing right here and you compare it to the bird wing over here, Okay, both used for the same function, same job, okay, same job, same function, but very different structurally. Uh, same thing with uh, insect wings. You could, I could have put a butterfly wing on here, okay, things used for flying. So structures, uh, why is that? Because they have evolved uh, wings in order to fly through the air. Okay, so they're very they don't have a very recent common ancestor, uh, but they have evolved wings for being able to locomote or move through the air by flying. 
Uh, the third thing, or the third thing under evidence besides uh, looking at anatomy is looking at embryology. Okay, remember when an embryo is when sperm meets egg, and then you get that first clump of cells, and it starts to grow into the new animal. Okay, or the new you. Uh, if we look at uh, embryos of different vertebrates. Okay, these would all be vertebrates, things that have backbones. Uh, we see that they are very, very, very similar. Okay, early stages of life. Okay, this would be <clears throat> chick. Here's human here on the end. You'll see that all these ones right here, chick, hog, all of those look very similar. And then as development progresses, uh, it becomes very, very different. Okay, so we all had uh, pharyngeal gill slits at one time. Uh, we all had sort of a early tail at one time, okay, but in a human, you can see here that that slowly, slowly disappears, okay, whereas other things, you know, keep that tail. Little turtle here keeps that tail, okay, and same thing with the gills. They'll develop uh, in the fish and so forth, but not, not in the mammals, okay, so why is that? Well, we think that points back to common ancestry a long, 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 long time ago, having a similar ancestor. And then those Hox genes, remember Hox genes are what control our body plan and our development. Okay, as those changed in different species over time, that began to change our body plan and our layout. Uh, but if we look at the embryo, uh, we can see some similarities there between all the vertebrates. Fourth thing for evidence are vestigial structures. Vestigial structures are structures we find in critters uh, that are reduced and don't have a function anymore, okay? So one of the examples is the vermiform appendix. Okay, your appendix, so here's the small intestine right here, right where the small intestine meets the large intestine right here. There's this little pouch right here, and off of that pouch, about the size of your pinky finger, is this smaller little pouch called the appendix. Uh, no known function other than it can get infected, and some of us have to have it removed. Okay, we think maybe long ago in an ancestor, this was more of a like a, a pouch that would help develop or help digest uh, grass and plant matter and stuff, but it's reduced. Uh, if you look at snakes, <clears throat> snakes have these reduced hind legs uh, that's kind of internal, and you can find these like little claws or, or toes that stick out on the body, even though they don't use them anymore. Uh, so snakes and the reduced hind legs. Uh, another example would be the whales. Uh, if you look at the skeleton of a whale, there's still what seems appears to be a vestigial pelvis there of uh, once okay they were land creatures once and then moved back into the sea uh, they had they lost their hind legs but the pelvic structure is still there okay what remains is still kind of part of that vertebrae uh, what would have been like a torso type system and so these structures again point to changes uh, that have happened in creatures over time and as parts aren't needed they're sort of reduced and not used anymore Another thing we used as evidence for evolution is similar DNA sequences. Uh, and this is a more modern one. This is obviously not one that Darwin used because we didn't know about DNA back in the 1800s or the function of DNA and the structure and so forth and how it works. Uh, but <clears throat> currently today we can sequence things, uh, different genomes or different proteins, and <clears throat> we can look at how similar they are and this provides very strong evidence for common ancestors. Uh, and we can set up kind of these phylogenic trees. Yeah, I'll write it over here. Phylogenic trees. Or sometimes we'll use them to make <clears throat> cladograms, which we'll discuss in class. And <clears throat> we'll put the oldest thing down here. And sometimes they go this way, sometimes they'll go this way. This one happens to be going this way. We'll put the oldest one here, and we draw this line with our different creatures kind of as off branches of those lines. Uh, so this is looking at the differences, of amino acid differences in hemoglobin, which is used uh, in the blood to carry oxygen. So it's 
again, not directly the DNA, but the DNA code, okay, because remember we go DNA, central dogma, DNA to mRNA to proteins, okay? So indirectly, the DNA leads to the proteins, which are made up of amino acids. So we look at the amino acid difference here between us <clears throat> and this little monkey thing right here about eight differences, okay? So pretty close split right there. Whereas a dog is 32, so that's a little further down the line. And then bird, 45. So you see, as there's more and more differences, it gets further and further away here. Uh, so hemoglobin is a big one. Uh, we also use a protein called cytochrome, cyto, whoops, cytochrome C, which is found in the electron transport chain of many, many creatures that do cellu aerobic cellular respiration. And we look at amino acid differences to figure out how related they are. Uh, the next one is biogeography. So bio meaning life, geography, where in the world do you live? A, one that we look at example that your book picks out is, I thought was kind of fun, was the biogeography of camels. Okay, so camels, we believe, originated in North America, okay, right over here, which we don't have anymore, but they spread south to South America, and that's where you get your llamas and alpacas, and then they went across the old land bridge up here in North America and over into Asia, uh, where they developed new adaptations, and so we get this different diversity of camels. So sometimes when we look at where things are in the world, uh, it gives us an idea of kind of where they originated from and what might be their common ancestor. And then we see different adaptations as they spread out through the world into different habitats and different environments. Uh, it leads to diversity, it leads to new adaptations. Another specific example of evidence from biogeography uh, is when we look at islands, because islands can be close together when they're kind of out in the ocean but also based on like in the Galapagos, the different weather currents and stuff, they can have very different uh, habitats on them. Some can be very arid and dry. Some can be very lush and jungly. Others can be like more grasslands. Uh, and so one big example that's often used are the Galapagos finches. Okay, they think they came from one original ancestor that got blown out from the South of America from the coast of South America onto these islands, and there were no other birds there. So there were a whole lot of habitats and food sources and nesting sites that were open to them. And so what we've witnessed or what we've seen or what we think happened is an adaptive radiation. So that single species kind of evolved into a whole bunch of new niches. And one of the main evidences we use are their beaks, okay? So you have these big wide beaks over here that are fruit eaters, or vegetarian tree finch, uh, into the insect eaters here. Uh, some of them, and you'll see this on the video that we watch in class, <clears throat> how some of them even use little sticks and stuff to get worms and stuff out of tree bark. So these kind of like long pointy uh, sharp beaks uh, into the uh, kind of the cactus finches. So they're kind of pointy. And then we have these pointy, big, thick beaks over here that are the seed crushing beaks over here. So we have <clears throat> about 13 species of finches that we find on the Galapagos, all with slightly different bill and beak size based on what habitat they fill. And we, you know, we really think they came from one single species uh, that blew out from the coast of South America. Okay, we have some evidence of these Galapagos finches. Peter and Rosemary Grant in the 1970s uh, lived on the Galapagos. Okay, married couple. Uh, isn't that so nice that they were in love and they loved science? Okay, and they spent decades there just studying these finches and they'd put up these big nets and the birds would fly into them, they'd capture them, they'd measure their beaks and then they'd let them go again. And they measured average beak size. Okay, so, and how many finches there were? Well, in the 70s, there were several droughts, and they noticed during a drought, 
that the average beak size or beak depth, they called it, actually increased uh, about a few millimeters. So the average beak depth in 1976 was about nine and a half millimeters. In 1978, it increased to about 10.1 millimeters. So in two years time, they saw an increase of about 6.3%. In other words, when it, there was a drought and it was really dry, the seeds and stuff would dry up. So the ones that had the bigger crushing beaks uh, were better able to get food. They actually observed female finches uh, looking at the size of the male beaks before they would mate. And they tended to prefer males with bigger beaks because they had an advantage. They had better fitness, as Darwin would say.